NAD declines during aging, and that's what we can see here. Activity or levels of NAD plotted on the y-axis against age on the x. And there, we can see that NAD levels are relatively high in youth, and then lower in advanced age. Now, to counteract the age-related NAD decline, NR, niacin, and NMN are popular. And we can see that by taking a look at NAD synthesis pathways, as shown here. So starting from NR, nicot nicotinamide riboside, or niacin as nicotinic acid, or nicotinamide, we can see that nicotinamide and NR are converted into NMN, which is then converted into NAD. Similarly, nicotinic acid is converted by a series of enzymatic steps on its own into NAD. Now, what's potentially underappreciated about NAD synthesis is that there's another branch that leads to NAD synthesis, as shown here, and it involves the amino acid tryptophan, which is commonly found in almost all foods. Tryptophan is converted also by a series of enzymatic steps into NAD. Now, is an age-related blockage in the tryptophan NAD pathway limiting conversion to NAD? That's what we'll go over in this video. And to investigate that question, let's take a deeper look for how tryptophan is converted into NAD. And that's what we can see here. So starting from the top, we've got tryptophan, and then we've got NAD at the bottom of this pathway. Now, first, tryptophan is converted by one of two enzymes, IDO or TDO, into kynurenine. TDO is Convert, converts dietary tryptophan in the liver into kynurenine, whereas IDO, indolamine dioxygenase, converts tryptophan into kynurenine in the presence of pro-inflammatory cytokines or immune activation. For example, interleukin-6, IL-6, TNF-alpha, or interferon gamma would lead to immune activation and increased expression of IDO, which would convert tryptophan into kynurenine. Now, kynurenine increases during aging, which is what we can see here in this study of about 2,600 people with plasma levels of kynurenine on the y-axis plotted against age, and in this case, the age range is from about 40 to 80 years. And there we can see that there is an age-related increase for kynurenine. So that we've got an age-related kynurenine increase, but a decline for NAD suggests that there's a blockage somewhere in this pathway. So let's see if we can find it. So going forward, kynurenine would then be converted into 3-hydroxykynurenine, also known as HK. And note that B2 is required for this conversion. So that raises the question, is vitamin B2, also known as riboflavin, is B2 status suboptimal, thereby limiting conversion of kynurenine into hydroxykynurenine, kynurenine, and maybe that's where the block in this pathway lies. So to, if that's true, we'd expect to see decreased hydroxykynurenine during aging. So is that true? Here we're looking at plasma levels of uh, hydroxykynurenine, HK, again plotted over that same age range, 40 to about 80 years, and we can see that there's, an, there's also an age-related increase for 3-hydroxykynurenine. So from that we can conclude that vitamin B2 is not deficient because we've got age-related increases of kynurenine and also an age-related increase for 3-hydroxykynurenine. -hydro if B2 is limiting, we'd expect to see, we would not expect to see an age-related increase for hydroxykynurenine. So let's go forward and see if we can find a potential blockage. 3-hydroxykynurenine should then be converted into 3-hydroxyanthranilic acid, HAA. And let's take a look at how HAA changes during aging. And that's what we can see here, plasma levels of hydroxyanthranilic acid on the y-axis plotted against age. And again, over the same 40 to 80 uh, year age range. And here we can see that HAA declines during aging, which then raises the question, or it raises the interesting fact that vitamin B6 is required for the conversion of HK into HAA. So is tryptophan conversion into NAD blocked by an age-related depletion of B6, vitamin B6? So if B6 is limiting, we potentially are getting a less efficient conversion of hydroxykynurenine into hydroxyanthranilic acid as a potential explanation for why HAA declines during aging instead of increasing during aging like kynurenine and hydroxykynurenine. So to address that question of B6 potentially being the block, let's take a look at how plasma levels of paradoxal phosphate, which is the exact version of vitamin B6 required for the conversion of hydroxykynurenine into hydroxyanthranilic acid. And that's what we can see on this plot, plasma levels of pyridoxal phosphate on the y-axis plotted against age. And in this study, the age range was from birth all the way up to about 90 years. And in this study, which included data from four separate studies, we can see that in each of them, there was an age-related decline for plasma levels of vitamin B6. So that then raises the question, can NAD, intracellular levels of NAD, be increased with vitamin B6 supplementation? So with, as a word of caution, 
the tolerable upper intake level for vitamin B6 has been defined by the Food and Nutrition Board at the Institute of Medicine as 100 milligrams per day. Now, to put that into perspective, the RDA for vitamin B6 is 1.3 to 1.7 milligrams per day, depending on age and gender, uh, pregnancy status, and factors like that. But nonetheless, that's a pretty wide range that, that we could potentially use to increase B6 with the potential goal of increasing NAD. So with that in mind, for my last blood test, for the 42-day period that preceded my last blood test, test number two in 2023 on March 6th, my average B6 intake was 3.2 milligrams per day. And for a long time, I thought that that may be sufficient because it's at least two times higher than the RDA. So with the goal of not just affecting homocysteine, and if you missed that video, I'll put that in the right corner, with the, the goal of potentially uh, increasing NAD2, I've increased my vitamin B6 intake for the my upcoming test on April 24th. So since the March 6th test, test I've averaged 10.2 milligrams of vitamin B6 per day. Now, this may not seem like a big jump, but it's a three-fold increase from where I was, and my goal is to increase B6 slowly because I, I want to increase NAD, potentially increase homocysteine, and not mess up any other biomarkers. If I jump too fast with too high of an increase, I think the possibility is greater to potentially affect other biomarkers uh, in a negative way. So I don't want to do that. I'm going to take it slow and see if I can find the minimal dose that maximally optimizes NAD, but also potentially homocysteine. And to do that, uh, I'm going to use Genfinity, which tests NAD. So stay tuned for that data in an upcoming video. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links in the video's description for NAD quantification, green tea, epigenetic testing, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing, diet tracking, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, that link and all the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.